Well, thank you, Leslie, and thank you, brothers and sisters, for coming this morning to what we consider to be a key moment in launching the elections of 2016. We are in the new year. We are in an election year. Uh, as we've all experienced, we've been in the election season for quite a while already, uh, but that's okay. We believe that's good. We believe that's good because we believe that the people of America uh, need to pay more attention to who it is that's seeking their vote, uh, that the people of America need to pour, pay more attention to what the process is by which uh, people get our votes uh, and why that matters. Uh, we therefore decided to have this press conference to begin a series of communications uh, to the American public about what we as a ministry of Priests for Life intend to do to help the people of God take their proper role in the elections of 2016. Uh, this is not about the church becoming a political machine. Uh, this is about the church becoming more the church. Uh, this is not about the church doing the, 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 the job of a political party or a particular candidate's campaign. Uh, this is about the church doing her job of activating, informing, not only educating, but inspiring the people of God to do what it is that they need to do, not only as citizens of heaven, but citizens on earth, citizens of the United States of America. What are they called to do, and how are they to do it? The church is equipped to carry out that task, because that task is part of the Great Commission. When our Lord said prior to ascending back into heaven, go and make disciples of all the nations and teach them to carry out everything I have commanded you. What we do, what we're going to announce in this and subsequent press events about our role in the elections of 2016 flows completely from the Great Commission. It doesn't flow from the platform of a political party. It flows from the Great Commission given by Jesus Christ. And our point is that because it flows from that Great Commission, we have the freedom to carry it out. Because it's Jesus Christ telling us to teach, to form people, to activate people, to make disciples of people, to make a change in the world, because this is a commission for us in the church from our Lord and Master and Savior, Jesus Christ, no human authority can tell us not to do it. No human authority can put limits on how much of the Great Commission we carry out. No human authority can put limits on how much of the gospel we preach. Now, some may ask, well, who's putting limits on this, and, and, and why, why are we saying this in the first place? And that's what brings us, brothers and sisters, to some very specific points when it comes to the church's role in the elections. Very specific points that have become very specific battles. Battles, first of all, in the minds of the pastors and of the people to whom they speak. Battles even in legislatures and in courts. There's an irony going on here that while the church is battling for religious freedom and very appropriately standing up for religious freedom in the courts, and we at Priests for Life are very much engaged in that particular battle. We are in the Supreme Court right now with our case against the HHS mandate of the Obama administration. We had a press conference here just uh, uh, before the holidays about that. And insisting that the government cannot force us to provide health insurance coverage for activities that we teach people should not do. Nor can they make us part of that whole scheme of the government to include to increase access to abortion and contraception even in the very process of opting out of it that we still become complicit in it this is a battle 
for religious freedom in which we are very much engaged and which many other institutions not only in the Catholic community but in other Christian communities are likewise engaged a number of Catholic dioceses for example are joined with us at the Supreme Court in this very case the irony I want to point out here today is that while on the one hand the church is very appropriately defending her religious freedom in opposition to mandates from the government that would restrict that freedom, many Catholic institutions and other institutions are at the same time issuing mandates of their own, restricting their own freedom to preach and teach the gospel. What I mean is that each election season, we end up seeing instructions of various kinds and memos of various types coming from dioceses and other Catholic institutions and from other uh, Christian entities as well, somehow telling us that we cannot really participate in the election process by doing, for example, clear teaching and preaching that the people of God have to elect public servants who know the difference between serving the public and killing the public. That among the issues uh, that people have to consider when they examine not only a candidate but a political party, first and foremost is whether that candidate or whether that party intends to carry out the primary purpose of government, to protect the lives of the citizens, to protect the rights of the citizens. That when we take a stand in teaching and preaching what the church has already said in key documents, like the document of Pope St. John Paul II, Evangelium Vitae, the Gospel of Life, and the document of our own Catholic bishops in the United States, Living the Gospel of Life, very clear assertions in these documents that abortion is not just one among many issues, but that it involves the very foundation of every issue, and in fact the very foundation of the state itself. John Paul II wrote, in Evangelium Vitae, that when a state allows the destruction of unborn children, it becomes a tyrant state. Those are his words. He also said in that same document that the disintegration of the state itself has begun when it permits the violent destruction of babies still in their mother's wombs. The disintegration of the state has begun. That sounds like much more than simply saying this is an incorrect policy or this is a bad court decision. We're talking about the disintegration of the state. We're talking about the transformation of the state from a democracy into a, into a tyranny. And my point is, can the preacher preach this? Well, of course the preacher can preach this because the preacher is ordained to teach and preach the teachings of the gospel and of the church to which he belongs. And so on the one hand, you cannot ordain somebody and send him out to preach and teach what the church teaches and then somehow put the brakes on and say, but you can't really say this or you can't really say that. Because why? Because of mistaken interpretations of the Johnson Amendment, about which we have legal experts here today who are going to say more, but about which I will simply say this, that we have a law on the books, which is being vastly misunderstood, misrepresented, in such a way, whether it's by the fact that we simply do not understand uh, this particular law, or whether it's by the fact that we are using the tax man as an excuse for our own fears and hesitations, whether it be one reason or the other, the fact of the matter is, we have not gotten in our institutional churches a proper understanding of what we really are allowed to do and what we aren't allowed to do. And at the same time, uh, we need to get that proper understanding for the very reasons I've already said, that we always need to have the freedom to do the task we've been given to do by our Lord. Make disciples of all the nations, teach the teachings clearly, and that includes teaching what you do when you go into the voting booth. Let me be a little bit more specific 
One of the key tools that we will use in this upcoming election is uh, my recently published book, Abolishing Abortion. And one of the things we have done in this book, we timed it to come out just prior to a major election year, and that's why it was published this past August. And one of the, uh, the key messages of the book is what I'm saying now, that the church has to have the freedom and exercise the freedom to be much more vocal and active in participating in elections. That's by teaching, by preaching, and by mobilizing the people. Now, we have this Johnson Amendment which says that uh, that we are not to intervene as tax-exempt organizations and, uh, um, and, and churches fall under that category uh, as well, not to intervene directly or indirectly in a political campaign. The question is, well, what does that really mean? And, of course, the law itself doesn't say what it actually means. In order to observe a law, you have to know what it means. In order to... In order to adjust your activity and your choices to not violate a particular law, you have to know where that boundary line actually is. In 2008, a study was done on the Johnson Amendment by the Congressional Research Service, and its report stated, quote, the line between what is prohibited and what is permitted can be difficult to discern. can be difficult to discern. So you're telling me I can't do something and you're not being clear about what it is that I can't do? That's exactly the problem here. And when somebody is told that they can't do something and then what it is that they cannot do is not specified, the result ends up being something that the Supreme Court itself has acknowledged as a problem and that is that people begin refraining even from activities that are permitted. And that's to the detriment of the church, that's to the detriment of America, that's to the detriment of the political process. When people don't end up participating because they're afraid that they're breaking some vague, undefined law. And we're saying that it's time for that to stop. We have to be clearer in our understanding of what is and isn't permitted, and then more courageous about carrying out that which is permitted. Now, let me read an example of what I mentioned earlier that um, comes out sometimes from uh, different uh, entities of the church when it comes to these memos that are, are circulated, and we'll see this happening in the coming months, uh, memos and directives from uh, dioceses. I'm going to read one of them here. I quote many of them in my, in my book. Um, and then this one in particular said, um, Catholic organizations may educate voters about the issues. In addition, they may provide neutral educational forums or information on candidates' positions or make known the church's position on issues. So far, so good. Then the memo goes on to say, Indeed, it is the church's right and obligation to make its teachings on moral ideas known. As long as these teachings do not run afoul of the rules on political activity. So in other words, we have this fundamental freedom to teach the gospel, but if some rules on political activity tell us to be quiet about part of it, we, uh, we have to be quiet. And we're saying, no, we don't. We're saying, no, we can't, if it has to do with the actual teachings um, of the church. As long as these teachings do not run afoul of the rules on political activity, what kind of rules? In another memo, it says, quote, impermissible activity impermissible activity. Number one, do not even appear to endorse or oppose particular candidates for public office or political parties. And I ask you, brothers and sisters, how can anyone carry out that particular piece of advice? How can you not even appear to favor or oppose a candidate who is in favor of child killing throughout pregnancy when you represent a church that says no abortion is ever morally permitted and that the law has to protect children from the beginning of their lives. How do you convey that message 
and then not even appear to oppose those who are conveying the opposite message. How do you advance a public policy that the bishops of the United States, that the Pope himself, that the Church forever has advocated? How do you advance a public policy that says you have to protect human life and not even appear to oppose a political party that says you may destroy human life for any reason or no reason at all throughout all nine months of pregnancy? How do you do that? And we are saying it is impossible to do that. Of course you're going to appear to be favoring a, 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 a party or a candidate who has the position that you yourself are articulating. And what we are saying is that the church has the freedom to articulate that position despite the resulting appearances. And let me tell you why appearing to endorse, appearing to favor a particular political party or candidate is not a violation of the nature of the church as nonpartisan because because we are saying that we are saying that the church is nonpartisan we're saying in fact that the church is transpartisan the church is beyond and above any particular political party or campaign church always has been again we're not saying here that the church should be turned into a political machine endorsing candidates. We are not saying that the church should do the job of political campaigns and parties. As I said at the outset, we're saying the church should do her job. But when the church does her job, she proclaims a message not from the platform of a political party, but from the platform of the gospel. And here's the point. You know that it's a nonpartisan message if it passes the following test. Whatever my message today seems to favor or oppose when it comes to political parties or candidates, what if tomorrow those parties and candidates swapped their positions on abortion, completely interchanged their platforms and, and their positions on this issue, so that tomorrow everything was reversed, everything was turned upside down in terms of who stood for what and who opposed what and which party is pro-life and which party is pro-choice. You tell me if in that new circumstance tomorrow, my message changes one iota. What word? What sentence? What paragraph of my message or the message of the church changes tomorrow? What part of the document, Living the Gospel of Life, changes tomorrow? If the political parties swap their positions, tell me what changes in Pope John Paul II's Evangelium Vitae. What paragraph has to be edited tomorrow? What pieces of it have to be deleted tomorrow? If the political parties and candidates swap their positions on abortions, you tell me. Because, brothers and sisters, the answer to that question is nothing changes. Because our message is not based on a political platform, it's based on the gospel platform, and we have to stop silencing ourselves simply because it seems to favor or oppose some kind of political platform or candidate's position. And yet, there is massive self-censorship going on, and we are calling for it to stop. Massive self-censorship. I believe, not only based on a misunderstanding of the law, but simply based on the fact that we don't want to be criticized. We don't want to be criticized. And if we don't want to be criticized, then we who are proclaiming the gospel probably are in the wrong job. This is a job, in fact, being a disciple of our Lord and bearing witness to the gospel in the ways that all of us do, not just those who preach in the pulpit, but each of us bearing witness in our families, in our professional lives, in our individual activity in, 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 in any kind of, of ministry or apostolate, are in fact going to face the criticism that is launched against anyone who stands for and with Jesus Christ. So we are um, going to engage this year in a number of educational efforts represented again in this book abolishing abortion educational efforts for the clergy and for the attorneys who advise them by means of seminars by means of law review articles 
uh, by means of, of healthy, robust discussion and debate that will help people get beyond some of the preconceived notions about what these limits are in terms of what we can say and what we can do. Besides that kind of educational activity, we are going to be um, leading by example, as we have done over the years, over many election cycles, and uh, urging, for example, nonpartisan voter registration activities in the churches, voter guides, which are often the subject of so many of these restrictive memos, voter guides by which the churches and their institutions can actually show the people in black and white what the positions of the specific candidates are. You can do that in such a way that does not constitute prohibited activity. Uh, we're going to continue to do that as we've done in, in, uh, in previous elections. Uh, and we're going to help get people to the polls. We're going to actually do voter mobilization. Uh, and uh, we'll talk a little bit more about this uh, later.